Welcome to a video lecture for The Cycle of Distrust, Chapter 12 in Predictably Irrational by Dan Ariely. My name is David Panush from the Edmund Burke School in Washington, D.C., and this is for the course Psychology 2. Uh, the main idea in this chapter is that distrust is widespread throughout our society and that it is costly to our economy. As distrust becomes uh, more, dis more common in the society, it's not just that we distrust companies, it's not more that we just distrust um, organizations or politicians, but we become more distrustful of everyone. Um, and trust, uh, Ariely argues, like money, is a crucial lubricant for the economy. So that is why it's costly uh, when distrust uh, permeates. Ariely set out to demonstrate just how distrustful people are uh, by setting up a booth uh, in the square. He had a table full of free money, and he wants to give it away to people. Uh, they did different denominations at different times. Sometimes it was $1, sometimes it was $20, sometimes it was $50 bills, and they were just giving them away for free. And the results show that even, uh, even when they were at the $50 mark, only 19% of people stopped by the booth. So, you know, four out of five people walk by a table full of money that is being given away for free with a sign right there that just says free money. Uh, the vast majority of people don't stop, and those that did stop even uh, oftentimes were very suspicious, you know, asking questions like, uh, do I have to sign anything, or, you know, am I going to get arrested after this, is there a camera, something along those lines. Um, so it was just uh, a lot of distrust being demonstrated. Most people were distrustful of something that was uh, free money after all. Uh, this is an example, or Ariel is going to make the connection, uh, that this distrust um, is an example in some ways of, a, of an old idea, an old concept in political philosophy and economics uh, called the tragedy of the commons. And the, the classic example is that there's a common a field uh, where people can take their sheep to graze and if everybody takes their turns and takes their fair part of the uh, common resource the reason the grass can regrow and everybody can keep grazing their sheep and, and it's all good in, in the commons uh, the problem is when some people take more than their fair share they they bring too many sheep to the commons or they let their sheep graze for too long and then the grass can't regrow and then what happens is everyone in the end ends up suffering long term. Short term, some people uh, get more benefits, but over the long term, the resource is tapped out and there's nothing left. Uh, and there, you know, and it is a tragedy, uh, so to speak, of the commons. Uh, also, a big part of this is there's no cooperation, uh, lack of communication, uh, and in many ways, uh, this, you know, we try today to solve this sort of problem with laws and regulations that keep people from over using uh, shared resources like, uh, you know, fish, uh, you know, fishing laws that don't allow you to, to overfish so that the population completely crashes and things along those lines. Um, the public goods game is a game uh, developed by sort of game theorists where you have uh, people play games and try to have them act rationally uh, in order to maximize their gains and losses and you use it to demonstrate um, what might happen in the economy if people were put into similar situations. In the public goods game people are asked to contribute to a common pot and as they contribute the common pot is doubled and then everybody takes out um, a bit from the common pot and ideally if you cooperate and you communicate everybody would contribute to the common pot the whole thing would double and everybody would double their money but what happens when you play the game <coughs> <coughs> excuse me uh, in a situation where people don't get to see what the other people are doing and they can't communicate eventually uh, some people try to freeload they try not to contribute anything to the common pot, but they still get something out of it. And uh, eventually, nobody ends up putting anything in because distrust has taken hold. Uh, Ariely argues that, that the trust in an economy is like a public good. It is like the commons, and it's important for the economy. So when it erodes, 
that it is just like a tragedy of the commons and, and the trust uh, erodes, then it hurts everybody, not just those who were dishonest in the first place. Uh, trust is good for the economy because it helps us communicate more easily. It helps us make financial transactions. It helps us simplify contracts. Uh, we have trust that people are going to pay us when they say they're going to pay us. We have trust that the bank is going to uh, have our money when we go you know, to the ATM machine, uh, etc., etc. And as we trust less and less, it makes it more difficult for people to uh, have economic transactions with one another. Uh, Ariely wanted to look at then, you know, if in we if we are in a situation where there's widespread distrust, what does that mean for somebody who wants to be honest? Uh, so he looked at online dating and of course found that there's widespread lying and widespread uh, lack of trust on both sides. Uh, men cared mostly about women's weight and women cared mostly about men's height and income. Um, uh, so accordingly, he found that women reported their weight to be substantially below average, while men claimed to be taller and richer than average. So they, in other words, they lied to appeal to the opposite gender. Um, generally speaking, people didn't lie drastically. They would exaggerate their height a little bit or exaggerate their income a little bit or diminish their weight a little bit, um, but they wanted to appeal uh, as much as they could to appear attractive. Um, what happens then if you're 5'10 and you make $60,000, which all might be perfectly reasonable, but the other 5'10, $60,000 guys are all claiming to be 5'11 and $75,000 guys? Well, then you really can't compete with them uh, if that's what women are looking for, which it appears they are to some degree. Um, so if you're honest, therefore you suffer a penalty. So this again is basically the tragedy of the commons. Everyone has to be dishonest or is incentivized to be dishonest because being honest just doesn't pay. Um, Ariely asserts that, that once we begin to cheat, even if only by a little, as in this case, over time it can become a habit. It just becomes easier for us to do it. Uh, unlike in some other uh, points in the book, I think, you know, in particular when he talked about arbitrary coherence, he proved that once people were stuck a certain way, they didn't like to move to another way of looking at things. Uh, this is, his statement here I think is intuitive, but, but we don't necessarily have a study uh, to prove it, so it would be interesting to sort of try and design one that, that would. Uh, how deep is the mistrust? Well, we did a couple other experiments to sort of demonstrate our mistrust. And in particular, it's about our mistrust of organizations, politicians, political parties, and corporations. Uh, so they took a statement like, the sun is yellow. And they asked people, do you agree or disagree with the, with the statement, the sun is yellow? Um, and most people, taking it on face value as an objective statement, agreed with it. Uh, then they said, the Democratic Party says the sun is yellow. Do you agree or disagree? And they also attributed it to the Republican Party, and they attributed it to a big corporation. And all of a sudden, the amount of people, a number of people, percentage of people who just said, yes, the sun is yellow, or um, and agreed with this clearly objective statement, started to question it. Well, it's yellow during the day, uh, but you know, in the mornings or in the evenings, sometimes sunset or sunrise, it's pink or orange or purple, so uh, the agreement goes down. People have a higher degree of skepticism, they put the statement through a higher degree of rigor, all of a sudden just because of the source uh, that they're questioning and they have a history of mistrust of that source. Uh, similarly, they did an experiment where people would listen to a stereo and then they would, um, or they would read a brochure about a stereo and then they would listen to it and decide how much they wanted to pay for it. So uh, they're listening, they read the brochure from the company that makes it um, with the specs and a description. Then they read uh, a brochure from an unbiased source, Consumer Reports, a presumed to be objective review of the stereo. Then they would listen to it and say how much they wanted to pay. And people were much more likely uh, to be positive about the stereo when they um, read the brochure from Consumer Reports. And they would pay, and on, on average, about $120, $130 more uh, than those who read the manufacturer's brochure. And I think this also, you know, harkens back to the chapter on expectations, that we know that if we have expectations, it actually changes our experience. It changes our, our opinions before, of, of an experience. Uh, the uh, experience is no longer objective. So in this case, um, 
people were set up with lower expectations when the uh, source of the description came from a source they didn't trust um, and higher expectations when it was, came from a source they did trust and that affected their actual enjoyment of the music. Uh, so Ariel has recommendations uh, for what companies or organizations or political parties could do if they wanted to get people to trust them and continue to trust them. He talks about transparency and honesty. Those two go together. Uh, sacrifice, especially if you make some sort of mistake. You know, you need to address consumer complaints if you make a mistake. Show that you're sacrificing. So show that you're, you care about consumers. Um, being fair and, and conscientious. All of these things could help to rebuild trust if you've lost it or to, of course, establish trust uh, if you're starting off. Uh, looking forward then, uh, again, he sort of, this is the same claim he made before, that, that because there is a mistrust and it's so widespread, it will take a long time to repair um, and that it, it's, it's entrenched. Um, and it, he says that one of the things we can do for consumers is reward the companies that embrace the principles that we just talked about of honesty and transparency and customer service. If you buy from them, then maybe only those companies will succeed and the other companies uh, will eventually fail and you create a different sort of corporate culture or a different sort of political culture um, or a different sort of leadership culture. Um, if you embrace these sorts of leadership qualities, that maybe then you begin to change society's uh, overall definition of what it means to be honest and trustworthy. Uh, that concludes chapter 12, uh, chapter 13, sorry, or 12, yeah, um, the cycle of distrust.